Hi there, and welcome to the second part on the series of how to read financial statements like Warren Buffett. When I first started investing, I was having a hard time understanding financial statements. So I wanted to make this series to explain how to look at financial statements to even those who know the bare minimum. In this video, we will be talking about the income statement, what every line means, some important ratios, and finally, what Buffett looks for in an income statement. So without any further ado, let's get started. In the book, it actually goes by income statement first and then balance sheet. But balance sheet is incredibly important for downside protection. And I am making this video series for mostly the beginners. So I have put balance sheet as first part to highlight the importance of downside protection. An income statement is reported for every three month period and at the end of the year. What we are looking for in an income statement is not if the company is simply making profits or losing money. We are trying to determine if the company has a durable competitive advantage that will make its shareholders rich. First line on the income statement is always total revenue. Revenue is the amount of money the company received in the time period of the income statement. In this example, it is roughly $11 million for Coca-Cola in the quarter. This line shows the amount of money that came in, not the profits. To get the gross profits, we have to deduct the expense of the goods sold, which can be found on the income statement as cost of goods sold. It represents the amount of money it costs for Coca-Cola to make the cokes they sold, which is the cost of materials and labor used to produce the goods sold. In this case, it is Coke. Deducting the cost of goods sold shows us the gross profit. In this case, it is around $6.5 billion. But gross profit is calculated by only deducting the cost of goods sold. It doesn't include administrative costs, depreciation costs, and so forth. But using the gross profit, we can calculate the gross profit margin, which is calculated very easily, dividing gross profit by total revenue. In Coca-Cola's case, it is 58%. Obviously, for most cases, higher the margin, the better. To give some other examples, Moody's is at 70%, Apple is at 43%, Meta is at 80%, and finally, Procter & Gamble is at 46%. All of these examples are obviously great businesses owned by many super investors, Buffett included. But in contrast to these great businesses, there are examples like Ford at 15%, Bet Bath & Beyond at 25%, and Tattooed Chef, last time they made profit, their gross margin was at 3%. Obviously, these are just examples, and the gross profit margin is affected by the sector the business is in as well. Also, there are cases like Amazon and Costco, where their lower margins is actually the thing that is making them great. But for this video, we are just looking at the basics in general. A high gross profit margin is created by the company's ability to sell its goods or services at a much higher price than what it costs them, and that generally shows a durable competitive advantage, but only if the company can do it consistently over time. Otherwise, it's just a matter of time before another company comes in and cuts the margins a little bit to gain market share and profits. To quote from Jeff Bezos, your margins are my opportunity. But if the company can consistently bring high margins over the years, even decades, that company most likely has a durable competitive advantage. In other words, a mod that we are looking for. Now, as I said before, gross profit only accounts for the cost of goods sold. But there are lots of other costs like administrative, research and development, and interest expenses. These are called the operating expenses. So a company with high gross profit can actually be a bad investment as well. On that note, let's look at the operating expenses. After gross profit, we have operating expenses. These are basically costs that are not used in the cost of goods sold line, such as research and development, administrative, depreciation and amortization, and so forth. Most likely, you can find a deep explanation on the notes of the income statement you are analyzing. Subtracting operating expenses from the gross profit gives us the operating profit or loss. Now the first line in operating expenses is selling general and administrative expenses. These can be management salary, advertising, travel costs, and so forth. Now this line can vary so much between industries. So instead of focusing on how many dollars go in here or what percentage of revenue, the key thing we need to be looking at is consistency. Now the reason for variance in this cost is because when the company sales drop, if they can drop their costs at the same rate, that starts eating away from the profits. If the company is consistently losing lots of its profits to selling general and administrative expenses, you may want to stay clear of it. However, it shouldn't be so low because that might cause other problems like losing their talent to competitors. This line varies very much from case to case. So these are the basics, but I suggest not only reading the footnotes, but also comparing the company against other competitors to get a better understanding. Then we have research and development, which I believe and also the writers of the book that I'm using for this series are believing to be a very important line. The reasoning is that a competitive advantage can be created by a patent or some form of technological advancement. But the patents come with an expiry date and technological advancements only have so much time before others follow and catch up or even pass it. 
so they always have to be the first ones to come up with the next thing. Thus, they spend hugely on research and development. And also, because they are consistently inventing new products, their sales and administrative programs are going up hugely as well. For example, in the first 9 months of 2022, Evy spent 16% of their gross profits on R&D. Adding their selling, general and administrative line as well make it go up to 55%. That is more than half of their gross profit. Same goes for most chip companies as well. For example, Intel in the last decade has been lagging behind mostly AMD and Nvidia. So now, in order to catch up, they are spending two-thirds of their gross profit straight into research and development. For example, Coca-Cola has no R&D cost. But, as we all know, they have to advertise like crazy. So 50% of their gross profit goes into selling, general and administrative expenses. But as writers say in the book, Warren will never wake up in the middle of the night worrying about Coca-Cola's expiring patent or their competitor's much better chip. Now we have depreciation, and you may see it under the cash flow statement. And most companies actually do that. But in the book, it was looked at in the income statement chapter. And so will I. And to clear things up, it is a non-cash expense, and companies report depreciation in the cash flow statement rather than the income statement, because companies choose to present depreciation in the cash flow statement as a way to provide more information about the company's cash flow, rather than simply reporting as an expense in the income statement. Now looking at what it is and how we can use it, depreciation is a non-cash expense used to spread the cost of tangible assets over their useful life. If you pay 1 million for a piece of machinery and it has a lifetime of 10 years, it depreciates $100,000 every year. Pretty simple. And depreciation is actually the letter D in the EBITDA. And we all know Charlie Munger calling EBITDA bullshit earnings. And the reasoning is depreciation and amortization are real expenses, as we just talked about. By the way, amortization is basically depreciation, but for intangible assets, like patents. The most important part in here, I believe, is that EBITDA, most of the time, is useless. Now we have interest expense. Interest expense is the cost incurred by a company for borrowing money and it is reported as an expense on the income statement, reducing the net income. Now if a company has lots of interest expense compared to its size, that could mean that they are in a very competitive industry and don't have a durable competitive advantage that we are looking for. Or that could mean they were the target of a leveraged buyout. Companies with durable competitive advantage have none to very little interest expense. But keep in mind that interest expense to operating income ratio varies massively between industries. So bottom line, in any industry, companies with the lowest ratio of interest expense to operating income tend to be the one with the long-term durable competitive advantage that we are looking for. And then we have gain or loss on sale of assets. But it is not a recurring line, and it is basically the money that company makes or loses from the sale of a property compared to its execution price. It doesn't really matter, but since it is not a recurring income, in order to determine the company's true value, it should be removed from the net earnings that we use to determine if the company has a durable advantage. Now we have income before tax. It is the income of the company after all expenses have been deducted, but not the income tax. It is literally the money that they have right before paying taxes. Also, in the book, writers say that this is the number that Warren Buffett uses when he is calculating the return that he is getting. There is not really much to say here other than making sure that if you are using before tax income for a company, just double check you are using the income before tax numbers for their competitors as well. And now we have income taxes. Obviously, it is the tax the companies have to pay based on their earnings. There is nothing to say for for mid, large and mega cap stocks here. But for small and nano cap stocks, when you are analyzing it, if they are not working with a big for audit firm and you want to double check their accounting, you can use this line to make sure their reports are in order. Currently, income tax for corporations in United States is at 21%. And if that doesn't add up with their income tax number, you may want to start asking some questions. Now we have net earnings. Net earnings is what we get after all of company's expenses and taxes have been deducted from their revenue. The first thing that Buffett looks in here is if the company's earnings going up over the years. Because at the end of the day, the stock prices follow earnings. One other thing that I find incredibly important is that as long as earnings trend to go up, Buffett doesn't care about some outlier years where they go down. As he famously says, Charlie and I would prefer a bumpy 20% over a smooth 15%. So don't get scared if a company's earnings go down in a particular year, and just make sure that you understand the reasoning behind it. If it is structural, you may want to sell it. But if it is a temporary problem, it might be a good time to load up even more. Another important thing is, as we all know, companies do buybacks. And as a result of buybacks, their earnings per share increase, even if the net earnings of the company doesn't. And in some cases, if a company's net earnings drop by 5%, but they buy back 10% of their shares outstanding, for example, that might make it look like the company is growing, when in fact its total earnings are decreasing. 
So Warren makes sure that he's looking at net earnings as well. In the book, the writers say that Warren has realized the company with a durable competitive advantage will report a higher percentage of net earnings to total revenues than their competitors in the same industry. And Warren has said that he would own a company making $2 billion in earnings on a $10 billion revenue rather than a company with $5 billion in earnings on a $100 billion revenue. And as the final line, we have earnings per share. And to clarify the difference between basic EPS and diluted EPS, basic EPS uses the number of shares outstanding currently, whereas diluted EPS takes into account the potential dilution of a company's earnings from outstanding options, warrants, and convertible securities. This is where buybacks come handy as we spoke before. And what Buffett looks in here is if the company can increase its earnings per share in longer periods, like 10 years. What Buffett stays away from are the companies with earnings going all around, like $2 in a year, followed by $5 loss, and then going anywhere between $5 loss to $5 earnings. Because that means that that business is in a competitive industry with lots of boom and bust cycles. So that was it for the income statements. You can check my video on balance sheet here as well. And I will be making a cash flow statement video as well. If you don't want to miss it, make sure you are subscribed and drop a like if you like this video. If you are interested in the book and want to support this channel, you can use my affiliate link in the description to buy it as well. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one.